So <clears throat> I don't know how many people here use Spotify. Uh, and of those who do use Spotify, I don't know how, fam how familiar you are with Discover Weekly. Uh, but Discover Weekly is this new feature that we just launched a few months ago that's basically a playlist of recommended personalized music for you. Uh, and it's had a lot of great feedback um, and uh, it's been in the press a lot lately. Uh, so we wanted to talk a little bit about Discover Weekly, uh, where the idea came from, how we executed on it. And we have a bunch of lessons in building recommendation products that hopefully everyone here can learn from. So just to introduce ourselves, uh, my name is Chris Johnson. Uh, I manage a team of machine learning engineers here at Spotify. I've been here for about three and a half years. Uh, originally worked on uh, the radio feature at Spotify. It was the first sort of recommendation feature we had. You can start an artist radio station, seeded from an artist or a song or a playlist, just like you can do with Pandora. Uh, from there, we built uh, things like related artists. Then in 2013, we launched the Discover page, which is this sort of personalized uh, page for uh, you to get all sorts of recommendations. Uh, and now, uh, 2015, we just re uh, released Discover Weekly, so that's the latest thing we've been working on. And do you want to? Sure. And hi. Oh, my bad. Hello. Oh, hi. I'm Edward. And yeah, I joined the team probably two and a half years ago, around the time we were launching Discover. Cool. So really quickly, uh, here's uh, basically Spotify and numbers. So if you're not familiar with Spotify, we started in 2006. Uh, we're a streaming music platform, uh, on-demand streaming, so you can log into Spotify, find anything you want, play it, create your own playlists, get recommendations, that sort of a thing. Uh, we're now available in 58 markets. Uh, we have 75 plus million active users. When I say active, I mean monthly active. Uh, 20 million of which are paying. So you've got a pretty good conversion funnel. Uh, we've got about 30 million songs on Spotify, 20,000 of which are added every day. Uh, we've got about one and a half billion user-generated playlists. Uh, about a terabyte of user data gets logged every day. And we process all of this data in our 1,700 node Hadoop cluster in our data center in London. And we run about 10,000 plus Hadoop jobs every day. So here's the challenge. We've got 30 million songs on Spotify. So how do we help users sift through all this music and find great recommendations? So here's some of the different features we've launched on Spotify. This was the Discover page I was mentioning. Uh, we launched this in 2013, uh, and it's changed a little bit since then. But uh, basically, you can log in and get a personalized feed of uh, recommendations for you. So you can see here, there's some strips. There's a top recommendations for you strip, new releases for you. And then we have strips similar to how Netflix does it, suggested for you based on something else you listen to. Uh, radio is another feature we have that uh, you can get recommendations on. So here I started a radio station from Sonic Youth, and we'll play music similar to that. And you can give it feedback. So you can give it a thumbs up or a thumbs down, and it'll start tuning to your taste. Uh, another place you can get recommendations is through related artists. So if you have an artist you really like, uh, and you're looking for art other artists that are similar to that artist, you can go to the artist page and find other similars. So here, I've gone to the Fleet Foxes artist page, and you can see there's a bunch of artists that are related to Fleet Foxes. So you can imagine going down this rabbit hole of continually clicking through related artists and going through this music wormhole. And finally, uh, this year in 2015, we just released Discover Weekly. So this is mainly what we're going to focus on in this talk. And it's this great uh, personalized playlist of music for you. Uh, so every week, every Monday, you wake up, you know, you're kind of sad. It's like, oh, the weekend's over. I have to go to work now. But things are better now. Mondays are a little bit better. You can wake up and, and start your day with uh, some fresh music recommendations. Uh, so it's a personalized playlist of music, like I said. It's available on all platforms. And every Monday, it's going to update with about two hours or 30 songs of new music for you. Uh, and it's been getting uh, quite a bit of press. So we just reached. Uh, Within 10 weeks, we reached 1 billion track stream from Discover Weekly. So this is a really cool milestone for us. And uh, I'm going to let Edward take over and talk a little bit about how we got there. Cool. Yeah, so just as Chris mentioned, this has probably been maybe the most successful launch we've had at Spotify. Um, so just next for a little bit, I'd like to talk about how we got there. Um, so as Chris mentioned and Pete, um, probably about two and a half, three years ago is when we launched our first personalized feature at Spotify, the Discover page. And it was a newsfeed kind of layout, kind of like a Pinterest layout. 
of a bunch of different types of content that were recommendations or personalized in some way. So we had stuff like recommended artists for you, um, new releases, uh, reviews, like concerts in your area, even stuff like playlists recommended based on what people are listening to in your social network. Um, and so it was cool because it was like this one place you could go and you could pretty much find whatever music content you wanted. Um, but one thing about it is that it required a ton of attention and interaction in order to find what you're looking for. Um, so you, you know, we figured users just scroll through the page until they found, okay, I was looking for this type of music or whatever, let's check this out. Um, yeah, so there was no real organization of content other than we tried to enforce that the content types that were different would be kind of placed near each other so there wouldn't be too many like new releases next to each other, things like that. Um, so we iterated on it a bit and then in 2000, towards the end of last year, uh, there was a major UX overhaul of the entire client, and um, that's when we came across this uh, Netflix-style layout, um, which we introduced across the other features, uh, like the browse um, genres, et cetera, uh, features on Spotify. And uh, for Discover, what we did is we just um, stripped away most of those content types and focused on simplifying it to just being albums that we could recommend to you and new releases. So. Like Chris mentioned, there's uh, suggested for you based on something you listen to, and then there's also strips around new releases for you, or just like top recommendations based on what you've been listening to lately. Uh, so it was more organized, so it's easier to navigate and figure out, you know, if like you're into a certain style right now, you could probably find that easier, but it still required a lot of interaction. Um, you would have to come in uh, every time you wanted to listen to a new album, re you know, interact with the page again. Uh, once you know the album finished, you would have to come back to the page. Like there was nothing that kept it continuously streaming or whatever. Um, so we compared this then to uh, the browse feature that we had just launched. And browse was the new home page for Spotify when you first log in, and it shows you just a list of playlists that are hand curated by our uh, internal editorial team. And it was stuff like your favorite coffee house or something that kind of captured a mood or a style. Um, and what was nice is that it's usually like something like four hours long. So once you found the style you're into, like study music, ambient, electro, or something like that, you just put it on and then you could go about your day uh, doing whatever else you were doing. So what we got from this is that users are spending a lot more time in Browse than they are in Discover. And you know maybe it just has something to do with the, the experience there. So an initial idea out of that is maybe we can combine the personalized experience of Discover with the lean back ease of the browse page. Um, another insight then is that around that time, in, at the end of last year, we iterated on our second uh, year in music feature. And so this was a separate web app that we sent emails out about where if you had an account, you could just log into it and it would show you a breakdown of your listening history from 2014. So, you know, it would be breakdowns of the styles you listen to, what your top artists were that you listen to, like what days of the week you, you stream the most, things like that. And at the very bottom of this uh, web page, we introduced this new feature called Play It Forward. And what this was is that it was like an opt-in playlist, pretty much. You could press the Create button, and it would return a new playlist into your, um, I guess, your list of playlists in the uh, desktop client. Uh, and it would just be stuff that's personalized to you that you haven't listened to before, but based on what you listened to in 2014, we think you'll like. Um, and so what this was based on is pretty much everything that powered Discover. So the same machine learning models, the same data pipelines, everything. It didn't really require much effort for our team to do this, but what we, what we found out was that this was actually a huge like success. Um, when we looked at our metrics, we saw there were like over 5 million unique sessions, almost 4 million unique users used this feature. And what was even more surprising is that over a month after the launch, there were still something like 10% of what peak traffic was was still engaging with this page and with that playlist. Um, so that kind of gave us, you know, a new idea. Like maybe um, another discovery product that'd be cool is like to take this play it forward idea, but to have it more regularly update it. So more regularly updated discovery kind of playlist. And so um, next step I'll give to Chris um, around how we could be data driven from start to finish in building something like this. Yeah, so I, th I think that kind of takes us to our first lesson here. Remember we're gonna have four lessons. It's actually five lessons, I added one at the end. But uh, yeah, so this brings us to our first lesson, which is really, I think, super important for bu building uh, recommendation products, and is to be data driven from start to finish. 
So what do I mean by that? Well, there was this really great blog post from uh, Dan McKinley, at, uh, formerly at Etsy, now at Stripe. Uh, but he was talking about Etsy's process and how it used to be and how it is now. And I thought it fit pretty nicely into Spotify, actually. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about sort of the wrong way to do things and the right way to do things. So in 2008, uh, Spotify had just launched. And uh, I think this is more like what the process was. You, know? you come up with some idea for some new thing. Uh, you spend you know, X number of months building it, and then you release it. And that's it. That's sort of the old school way of doing things, right? The problem with this is you, know, you get no feedback, you get no refinement, and you're not learning anything. So by 2013, we were getting a little smarter about this. Uh, A-B testing was a pretty regular thing at Spotify by this time. We basically A-B tested everything. Any new feature, any new content test, we would A-B test it. Uh, so the process was more like this. You, know, you come up with an idea, you spend some time coding it, and then uh, you know, you'll A-B test it. So let's say you come up with a new idea for a start page. You'll spend X number of months coding it up, uh, and then you'll A-B test it against your current start page. Maybe it succeeds, maybe it fails. Um, and based on your A-B test results, you'll release or not release. Uh, the problem with this is you know, you've still got this long cycle of where you're you know, spending four to six months building this thing, and you're not getting any feedback. You're not refining. Uh, so to me, this really isn't being data-driven. Sure, at the end, you know, you, you're releasing an A-B test, and you're deciding whether or not to release uh, in, uh, based on your data. But it's not data-driven from start to finish. So this is really, again, I think the wrong process. Uh, so by 2015 and with Discover Weekly, I think we've kind of gotten in a pretty good groove of how this, this should actually work. Uh, so with Discover Weekly, it was more like this. You know, we, we had this idea, we had these insights, uh, and we validated them quickly. So things like the Play It Forward playlist, where it was very little friction. We didn't need to scale it up to, to all of our users. It was an opt-in sort of thing. Uh, it's an easy way to sort of validate a hypothesis. And we did, and we saw great engagement from that playlist. So from that, you know, the next step would be to prototype something. Uh, and you know, get some more further feedback, maybe run even a small A-B test, but again, not scaling something up to all your users at first. And so there's this process of sort of you know, validating your hypothesis, prototyping, testing with a small number of users, refining your process, um, and then eventually uh, running your A-B test, scaling up, and releasing. So this is more of the process that I think we're starting to follow, and I encourage more organizations to follow. Uh, so how do you go about doing this? Well, here's, here's, um, here's a super important thing to do, uh, and it's to define your success metrics before you release your test. Uh, so I see this a lot at companies is, uh, you know, you'll sort of, you'll, you'll list out these 10 things that you care about, you know, maybe 10 metrics or something, you know. You care about DAU, you care about time spent, you care about, you care about CTR or something like that. Uh, you just list out these things. And then you know, you'll run your A-B test, and then you'll see you know, uh, some things increase and some things decrease. Maybe this feature is great for your existing users, but it really sucks as an experience for new users. Uh, and then you try to decide, what do I, so what do I do now? And you kind of make the data work for you. You're like, well, it's, it's good for existing users. It's OK that it's not so good for new users. I think this is a win. Um, and this is wrong uh, for a lot of reasons. So I think one thing that's really important is you should define your success metrics before you release your test. Uh, and that way, you know, you're not making, you're not sort of interpreting the data how you want. Uh, you're, you're sort of making uh, your insights based on the data that you have. So, so that's super important. Uh, and uh, one thing that I always like to talk about is, is kind of, I, I think, you know, for the most part, uh, you can kind of define uh, what you're trying to do into these sort of three buckets or these three classes, reach, depth, and retention. And so what do I mean by this? Uh, so reach is like, uh, how many users are you reaching? So with Discover Weekly, the, uh, the reach would be, how many users can we reach with Discover Weekly? Uh, the depth is, for the users you do reach, what is their depth of reach? OK, so not only how many users are we reaching, uh, when we're reaching them, are we reaching them for, you know, they just come in every Monday and stream for 10 minutes and then leave? Or are they coming back in and spending hours every day? That would be a very different case, right? And then retention is, for the users that we do reach, uh, how many of them do we retain? So our users coming in, loving Discover Weekly the first week, and then it gets stale week after week, and so they start dropping out. That's a bad thing. We want to try to retain our users. So for Discover Weekly, these were the key success metrics that we defined before we released our test. So we said we really care about uh, reach. So we care about uh, how, many, uh, how many users are coming in and using Discover Weekly every week. So of all the users coming into Spotify, what percent of them come in and use Discover Weekly uh, in a given week? 
uh, depth is for the users that we are reaching, uh, how much time are they spending in Discover Weekly? Are they spending 10 minutes or are they spending five hours? And then the last thing is retention. So week over week, how many users are we retaining? So going back to this model, this is the point where we were at a prototype. So we've already validated our hypothesis with the Play It Forward playlist as part of the year in music. So now we're at that point where we wanted to actually prototype something. So often our first step when we're prototyping is an employee test. So, you know, it might be kind of obvious, but a great place to gather feedback when you're prototyping is your organization itself. So Spotify, you know, we've got, uh, you know, around 1,700 employees, so this is a great place to gather feedback uh, around how, how something is working, especially a recommendation product. So the first thing we did was we generated a bunch of playlists for our employees. Again, it's pretty easy because we don't have to scale up, right? We don't have to generate these for 75 million users. We should have to generate them for 2,000 or so employees, so it's pretty easy. Uh, so not scaling up, just generating something for employees. Um, and basically we took this playlist and we just sort of sneakily forced it in everyone's root list. So we didn't tell people we were doing this. All of a sudden, people logged into Spotify, employees, and they would just see this Discover Weekly playlist there. And we wanted to see, like, you know, are people going to notice this? Are they going to uh, start questioning it? Uh, and I think we mentioned, yeah, we mentioned uh, in the description of the playlist, we said, you know, hey, if you happen to find this, by the way, it's an employee-only test, but send us an email if you have any feedback. I think in, like, the first week, people started discovering this, and we started getting tons of email and uh, it kind of became this, this sort of viral thing internally where like people were, you know, started, started discovering it, telling their friends in the office, like, hey, have you found this Discover Weekly thing? Like, who's this Lambda squad? I've never heard of them. So it was kind of cool. It was like this sort of like viral marketing, but within the company. Um, so we actually tracked the employee test, which is kind of funny, right? Uh, we, we actually built dashboards and tracked how we were performing with our employees. So you can see here, this is our, these are our reach, uh, our reach depth and retention metrics. And we started tracking them for employees. And we saw a pretty cool thing. As you can see here, like, people start discovering the playlist. And, you know, our week AUs, like 20% of employees or something. And then all of a sudden, like, it starts going viral. And all of a sudden, almost half of all employees are using this thing every week. Uh, and you know, what's the retention like? Well, it's like 80% or something. So it was huge. The employees that found this thing, they would come back to it every week. Um, so this was really cool. Uh, so at this point, we decided, okay, this, thing, this thing's pretty good. We're getting tons of feedback. We're refining our process a bit as we're get, getting feedback from our employees. And we decided it's about time to run an A-B test with actual users. So when we get to this point, uh, again, we're not going to scale up to all users. We're just going to uh, roll something out to 1%. And uh, we got a little creative here. So. Uh, we started to realize that, you know, uh, we can really reach users on a personal level here. So we started thinking about, initially, you know, we just had this, this generic astronaut man as our image for the playlist. And then our designers started getting creative and thinking, hey, maybe we can actually, you know, make this feel really personal. We can start bringing in user images and things like that. Uh, so we actually launched uh, two tests out to users. One that just had the generic astronaut and one that actually had a personalized image. And then we got even trickier. Uh, we threw in this link to a Google form. So we, this is kind of like a beta test. Uh, and, and again, we just took it and just shoved it into 1% of users' uh, root lists. So we didn't tell users this was coming. There was no onboarding process. It was just users would log in, and then maybe they'd notice that there's this Discover Weekly playlist there. Um, and uh, you know, using the description, we were able to get a Google form in there so that users could give us actual uh, qualitative feedback. Pretty cool, we had uh, uh, a lot of responses in this Google form for the 1% test. So we got, uh, within a few weeks, I think we had like, yeah, I guess, you know, a little over 1,200 responses. And they were generally very positive. So you can see here, uh, we gave users the ability to rate it on a one to five scale. And like 65% were like, hey, this is like five stars, this is amazing. And we got tons of uh, feedback. You could, the users were giving us comments. And, you know, we used all these insights to decide, you know, how do we want to scale this thing up? What worked about it? What didn't work about it? How do we refine it? And so, again, going back to that data driven from start to finish, it's very important to kind of, you know, gather data and feedback very, very early on before you scale up. So another thing uh, that we learned uh, early on was uh, the personalized image actually had a lift of 10% in week AU. 
So this was actually pretty surprising to us. We didn't, you know, we didn't really think that we'd see any difference in the metrics, but it turned out that it actually made a huge difference. Uh, so when we were doing this and we were thinking about it, it was like, okay, if we're gonna actually do this at scale, these images, these personalized images for 75 million users, it's gonna take quite a bit of infrastructure that we don't currently have. Uh, so this really informed us on, hey, this is actually worth it. We're gonna get this 10% lift if we actually do this. Uh, so that brings us to our second lesson, which is uh, to reuse existing infrastructure in creative ways. So the, one of the coolest things about Discover Weekly is that, uh, you know, we basically are just reusing stuff we already had. The algorithms were the same algorithms we were using for the Discover page, the same algorithms we were using for radio, uh, the actual UI and format. We were just reusing the playlist system. We already had this great, amazing playlist system at Spotify, and we're just reusing it. Uh, and then also I want to encourage you to kind of think of uh, creative ways in which you can reuse your infrastructure. So things like, you know, we reuse the uh, description in order to put this Google form in to get uh, feedback from our users. We're using the image as a way, as sort of a, a vessel to kind of communicate with your users and make this thing feel really personalized. Uh, so the actual work that went into Discover Weekly was actually very little uh, because we're reusing things that we already had. So here is more or less the Discover Weekly data flow. Uh, and I've kind of included our data flow for other features on here, so you can kind of see that Discover Weekly was really very little extra work. Uh, so this is kind of the flow at Spotify. You know, you, over here on the left, you've got the clients, so our users, they come in, they'll hit an access point. Uh, we have data centers in uh, Stockholm, London, Ashburn, Virginia, and San Jose City, California. So you'll hit an access point, and then you'll go and you'll try to stream from a feature. Maybe you stream from an artist page, a playlist. Maybe you go to the Discover page. Uh, all of our streaming uh, data gets uh, passed through Kafka, a distributed message uh, passing framework, and we have uh, hourly jobs that will then uh, basically listen to Kafka and propagate all of that into Hadoop distributed file system. Uh, so everything goes into HDFS, and we run a lot of Hadoop and scalding jobs. Scalding is this great framework uh, based on top of cascading. It's a higher order framework for running Hadoop jobs, um, and you can write all your jobs functionally in Scala. It's really nice. Uh, so we'll run a bunch of scalding jobs, train some recommendation models. Uh, you know, so we have some batch collaborative filtering models, some NLP models on you know, track data or news and blogs and that sort of a thing. Uh, we also uh, analyze our raw audio and train some models on that. All this went into a recommendation pipeline that was already powering the Discover page. So really all we needed to do here was just also pump out these playlists for Discover Weekly and then find a way in order to publish them. And as long as we could do that, we could scale up Discover Weekly to all of our users. So really reusing infrastructure was a huge, was a huge win for us. So we talked really briefly about recommendation models, and then I'm gonna hand it back over to, to Ed to talk about the publishing. So we use a ton of recommendation models at Spotify, and we're continually trying to improve upon them. So I just wanted to very briefly uh, give an outline of the kinds of things we're looking at. Uh, so kind of the lifeblood, I think, of, of recommendation models at Spotify is generally collaborative filtering. And when we're talking about collaborative filtering at Spotify, we're generally talking about uh, implicit feedback collaborative filtering. Uh, so one thing we do a ton of is uh, uh, latent factor models using our implicit feedback uh, data. So we have a lot of data on what users are streaming. And it's implicit feedback, right? Because just because you listen to something uh, doesn't necessarily mean you're saying, I explicitly like this thing. If you listen to Michael Jackson uh, three times, does that mean you really love Michael Jackson or are you just kind of passing through? If you listen to something one time, maybe that's even a negative signal, right? Uh, so this is kind of the framework for how you can do an implicit matrix factorization. Basically, you aggregate all of your user and track streams into a big matrix and make it a big binary matrix. So place a one anywhere that a user streams something and a zero everywhere else. And then the goal is that you're gonna approximate a binary preference, this binary preference matrix by the product of two smaller dimensional matrices. But we're gonna do, and how are we gonna do that? Well, we're gonna solve a weighted least squares, and we're gonna weight based on the number of times you streamed. So if you streamed Daft Punk 1,000 times and Michael Jackson once, we're gonna place more weight on the Daft Punk positive signal. And so that's what this, uh, if, if you're pretty familiar with least squares, I mean, that's essentially what we're doing here. And then you've got this CUI term. That's the confidence. That's how much we're gonna weight our individual entries. So I know this is a little bit hand wavy and quick, uh, but come find me later if you're interested in this sort of thing. Uh, another cool thing is you can actually replace the least squares loss with a logistic loss. Really simple, it's the same exact sort of setup except now instead of using a least squares loss, we're using a logistic loss. And I think this kind of makes a little more sense for binary data 
because least squares doesn't make, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense, I think, to say, hey, we're looking at the difference between you know, a one or a zero and your predicted rating. It, it doesn't make much sense when, when it's binary data like that. So I think logistic loss actually works a little bit better here. Uh, so this is essentially the same setup, except now we're just using a logistic loss. Uh, uh, I have a paper on this that you can find online called Logistic Matrix Factorization for Implicit Feedback Data, if you're interested. Uh, the next thing we look at, we, we run a lot of uh, NLP models, natural language processing models, on uh, news and blogs. So we scrape the web to see what the web is saying about artists and what kind of vocabulary they're using. So you can imagine, you know, uh, users that are, or blogs that are talking about Kanye West might be using the same vocabulary as, say, uh, Jay-Z or something like that. And so you can sort of deduce that there's this similarity between artists just looking at news and blogs and natural language text. So that's something we do a ton of. Turns out that NLP models um, work really, really well on playlists. Uh, so this is something that Eric, who you, you uh, heard talk yesterday, um, discovered really early on, is that we've got this treasure trove of one and a half billion playlists that are, it's an amazing data set because you can think of them as just a bunch of documents and then you can think of all the tracks inside the playlists as just words. And so now we've got all of these documents with words that are cleverly placed together such that the ones that are close to each other are similar in some way. And when you've got one and a half billion of them, you've got so much data that you're gonna find these very sort of niche uh, similarities. And so uh, we do a ton of analysis on playlists. And actually, I think this is, you know, if not the most important piece of data we have for Discover Weekly. Because if you think about it, we're trying to build a personalized playlist of music, and we're training on one and a half billion playlists that other users have created. And so we're learning how do you create a playlist. We've got tons of data on that, so we can actually train algorithms to understand how you create a really great, amazing playlist. Uh, the last sort of area that I'll mention here is we also look at our underlying audio content uh, and try to train latent factor models on that. Uh, so a couple summers ago, a uh, guy, Sander Dealman uh, from Ghent University, he's now at Google DeepMind, uh, he came and did an internship with us and he had this really great paper on how you can train convolutional neural network models on uh, the raw audio data. This is an audio spectrogram here. You can think of it as a time frequency uh, data. And basically, tr you train some convolutions with some max pooling. At the end of all of this, you're trying to predict uh, latent factor models that have been trained using collaborative filtering. So now you, know, you can train this model. You have a new song come in. Even if you don't have any user data on it, it's not been added to any playlists. Uh, you can actually run the raw audio through this model and get out a latent factor vector that actually kind of makes sense. So this is another area we look at. Uh, so I mentioned latent factor models a bunch, but really what am I talking about when I say that? Uh, so if you've never seen this before, essentially all the models that we're training, they're placing all of our uh, songs on Spotify in this high dimensional space. So think of it like a 40 dimensional or a 100 dimensional space such that the items that are very similar to each other are gonna be close in that space, defined by some metric. In our case, it's generally the cosine distance. Uh, so here, if you normalized all the tracks, uh, the cosine distance between them is essentially the similarity between the tracks. Uh, so how many people recognize all four of these album covers? Yeah? That's awesome. One person? Okay. Sorry. I did this at another, at another conference and, and like nobody knew it, so I'm really happy we got at least somebody. Uh, anyways, you're super cool. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, so essentially, you know, we put all the songs in this space and we also put users in this same space, right? And so then what you can do is you can just look at any user in this space and you can look at the cosine distance to all the songs and the ones that, have the, uh, that are the closest are gonna be essentially the greatest recommendations for you. Uh, so that's basically recommendation models. I'm gonna hand it back over to Ed and he's gonna talk about how we scale up. Yeah, so getting back to Discover Weekly then. Um, so yeah, we've discovered from our A-B testing, our user tests that this is great. Now we have to worry about the hard part, um, scaling it up to 100% of our users. So this actually did turn out to be um, the most expensive part of the project, and it had to do with interacting between three different offices. Gothenburg in Sweden is the uh, office where our team that handles the playlisting system operates out of. Uh, there's also an office in Stockholm um, that handles some other of the, you know, the systems involved. So the major challenge then is how do we create and publish 75 million playlists 
in a timely manner. Um, we wanted to do it all within a week, and that was to align with an internal press announcement around it. We didn't want to announce, hey, there's this cool new feature, and then like have most users go to check for it and can't find it. So um, we gave that constraint, and then additionally, the constraint around the personalized images. Since we saw such a huge lift in engagement for users that had um, their image personalized to their Facebook image, uh, we decided that right out of the gate, we, we should try our best to um, have that as the initial feature. So we had to interact with the Facebook API, do a lot of uh, image processing, and also um, upload this to a different service. And then, of course, uh, Spotify is an international product, so we'd have to worry about translating not only the description of the playlist, but also the image where it says Discover Weekly into what would be relevant in like 20 plus different languages. Another end of it then is the weekly refresh. So we've constrained ourselves to say, hey, everybody, this is going to be available for you on Monday mornings. Um, so it's the first time, I think, with Spotify where we've had a really time sensitive update to worry about. And uh, you know, with that came a lot of other things. Like um, we have to worry about time zones, for instance. Um, somebody in Australia would need to see this. I think it's probably going to be refreshed in the next couple hours from for Monday morning. Um, whereas in the in Europe or the US, it's going to be later in the day. Um, so how do we refresh 75 million playlists every Sunday night? So just a quick overview, overview of the um, publishing workflow. Here's what we ended up with, and this was the quickest way to get this out. So we start with our Discover Weekly recommendations, which are um, you know based on Hadoop jobs, so they live in HDFS. And we have a publisher that uses RabbitMQ to parallelize the publishing. So there's two major things it's doing. One is that each of these um, workers is going to, for each playlist, check with Facebook to see if the user is connected, but also if their image has changed. And if so, we'll have to kick off a new image processing and, um, and transcoding. So transcoding is where you basically resize it for different platforms and stuff. Uh, so we have a separate service for that. And we store those images up on CDNs around the world. And then the main thing is to interact with the playlist backend and um, update the playlists. Uh, so ideally, we wouldn't have this crazy workflow. We'd probably have something like take the recs from HDFS and ingest them into Cassandra. But due to the complexity of the playlist backend, we went with this approach first. So um, that's pretty much you know that's the high level. It worked out for better or for worse. And right off, uh, right right out of the gate, we started seeing some great feedback on Twitter. You know, pleasantly surprised. A fair assessment of my taste. It's scary how well Discover Weekly knows me. Um, it's nice when someone gets you. Stuff like that. We also had probably the most press coverage of any release um, to date for Spotify around this. Uh, pretty much all the major press outlets picked up some kind of story around Discover Weekly, and some are still coming out. Um, the other end of it was <laughs> sometime in uh, September, we actually had a oops and didn't update on time. And what actually turned out to be interesting is that users reacted to this, and we could really tell, wow, people are really engaged with this playlist. So we saw stuff like it's 10.41 AM on Monday, and I haven't seen an update yet. Uh, I'm having an existential crisis and stuff like this threw me into a blind rage <laughs> when my playlist didn't show up. So yeah, so you know, we learned from this some other things like you know we have to worry about um, Sunday night updates and make sure that our team here in New York is uh, capable of handling on call stuff like that. Um, so that's been good, and then I'll hand it back to Chris to talk about what's next around iterating on content quality and other things we're going to do with Discover Weekly. Yeah, so so uh, the last thing is once once we've got this thing out there, it's you know, uh, what's the last step? And the last step is really to continue to iterate. So you know, we've released this this great feature, but that's not the end of the game, right? Uh, so now we get to the really interesting part where we can continue to iterate on the quality and improve it. And now we're getting tons of feedback data, so we know what users are listening to, we know what they're skipping, we know what they're saving, and we're going to use all of that to continue to improve upon Discover Weekly and make it even more awesome. Uh, so. Oops, these ones again. OK, cool. So uh, basically, this is sort of the flow that we're looking at now. Uh, so one thing that's super important with recommendation models is getting this feedback loop in. So once you've got your recommendation model out there, it's great, because now you're going to start getting feedback on what users are using, what they're interacting with, saves, skips, that sort of thing. So this is sort of what the flow looks like. 
we, we train a bunch of collaborative filtering models, we get a bunch of signals, both track signals and user signals. How popular is a song? How recent is it? You know, maybe you're gonna discover that uh, certain users only wanna see new stuff in their Discover Weekly. Well, other users, you know, they, they wanna dip into, you know, old, like, Grateful Dead B-sides or something, right? So the idea is to take all the track signals, all the user signals, and we're gonna combine them. And how are we gonna combine them? Well, we're gonna use feedback data from Discover Weekly in order to combine and train those models, train hyperparameters, figure out how to weight different signals. Uh, and so you end up with this great feedback loop of where you're you know, combining signals, you're getting some recommendations, you're putting them out there, you get new feedback, you retrain your models, and so you end up in this continual feedback loop of always kind of improving your models and putting out new recommendations. Uh, one thing that's super important with this is that all this feedback data is gonna come with a presentation bias. So we learned this really quickly. Uh, you know, we put Discover Weekly out there, we start getting feedback data, and now you look at your recommendation models and you try to predict, you know, is this gonna be a skipped song or is this gonna be a saved song? And what you're gonna notice is that it can't distinguish between the two. So if you tried to build, let's say, uh, an area under the rock curve for this, it looks, looks like you're doing terrible. Well, that makes sense because your recommendation models think that all of these songs are good on your first iteration. Uh, so one thing that becomes super important is sampling random negatives, and this helps you sort of step out of that presentation bias a little bit. Uh, so to illustrate this a little bit better, this is kind of the situation. I like to think of it as this sort of reinforcement learning view. So we've got this sort of current view of the world, right? And we're gonna get some positive and negative feedback back from that, and we're gonna use that to sort of step in the right direction. Uh, and then we're gonna get some more feedback, and then we're gonna use that to step in another direction. And so it's this sort of constant flow of stepping in another direction of the world, and we're very slowly, as we gather feedback, gonna try to reach the optimal view. Um, so this is kind of a way to think about it, I think. Uh, so that brings me to our last lesson. Uh, or actually, there's, there's, one, there's one extra one. <laughs> uh, so lesson four is essentially this. Um, in the end, you know, users know best. A-B test everything. It doesn't matter how our offline metrics are performing. It doesn't matter uh, what employees are saying. It doesn't matter what some small group of 100 users that you're testing with are saying. At the end of the day, the only thing that matters is your users. So at the end, always A-B test everything, and that's what you're gonna fit to. Uh, and then the final lesson uh, is essentially this, and I think this is really the story of Discover Weekly. Uh, Discover Weekly wasn't something that was handed down by uh, executives in the company. It wasn't, you know, we had this great grand strategy about building these playlists and it was gonna be amazing and we included, you know, hundreds of engineers in this it's amazing process. Uh, no, it, Discover Weekly was, um, you know, three engineers who were noticing some insights in their data and the features they were working on and then decided to build something. So I think the, the real magic of Discover Weekly to me was that it was, bottom, was bottom-up innovation. So I think this is super important. I think if you empower bottom-up innovation in your organization, amazing things will happen. Uh, so this isn't to say that you shouldn't have long-term planning and you shouldn't, uh, you shouldn't do that, but I think empowering bottom-up innovation and trusting your engineers uh, is super important. So that's it, thank you very much. Um, I just wanna mention also, we're hiring machine learning and data engineers, uh, so find us, come chat with us, thanks. And we've got a few minutes to uh, answer a few questions. Yeah, so I'll run the mic around um, if you raise your hand. Hi, uh, it was a great talk, thanks. Uh, so my question is, uh, how often do you have to relearn your uh, machine learning models, and uh, uh, do you have any specific strategies for like uh, temporary shifts in uh, uh, preferences, uh, just like in news and stuff, uh, or is it just a universal model that uh, does good enough? Yeah, so I think if I understand the question, so you're asking, I think you asked two questions. One is, how often do we train the models? And then the second is, how do we deal with shifts in data? Is that right? Okay. Yeah, so uh, the models themselves we train weekly. So uh, we'll, tr we'll train our models every week, uh, which will in turn generate new recommendations. So not only are the individual models being trained on new data sets, but the feedback used to combine signals is gonna change every week. So the recommendations are gonna be slightly different each week, which is great because that means we're also gonna get feedback on new data points. And so it's sort of reducing that present, that presentation bias is gonna get reduced over time because we're gonna be sort of sampling from the full world, right? Um, so every week about is when the recommendation models get trained. 
Uh, and then the other question you asked was, how do you deal with uh, shifting um, things? Like maybe you know, in the news, thing, you know, news articles are shifting, new artists are coming in. How do you deal with that? Um, so one thing I should mention is uh, on the actual user data, so looking at what users are listening to, we use an exponential time decay. So the stuff, for example, you listened to last week is going to count a lot more towards your Discover Weekly playlist than the stuff you listened to three months ago. And we do the same thing with news articles and that sort of thing. Articles that came out last week count much higher than articles that came out you know, 10 weeks ago. So if an artist like Drake is really shifting his sort of music personality, we want to try to fit more to the more recent news.